uh, good evening everybody uh, and welcome to a little show and tell of our product called skizzle so i'd like to break this talk down into four parts uh, basically let's start you know first part will be some context setting some introductions and uh, a little bit about our product our motivations etc uh, then then we'll jump into some of the more interesting stuff which is of course we'll do a live demo of skizzle and then let's actually jump into you know uh, uh, the tech bits uh, behind skizzle and more specifically how how we actually achieve end to end encryption so uh i'm mayur relekar i'm a uh, i'm the founder of a company called uh, newfang uh, where we are building a product called skizzle and i've been a entrepreneur in the past uh, and two other two other startups that i had founded both were failures so i'm here hoping third times the charm for us and uh, i work with a, a great team of guys um, uh, arvind who heads our growth and abhishek who is our tech lead were both my colleagues for the past uh, oh, their colleagues for the past 6 years now and we were working the at at a technology services company here in bangalore and saurav has joined us also and saurav happens to be like uh, like a blockchain dev but really he's a man friday he can do just about anything that is required of him and uh, uh, saurav is in fact still in college he's in his final year and once he graduates uh, you know he'll be on board with the team completely so uh let me tell you a bit about newfang before we actually get into skizzle so uh, newfang is a company uh, founded in 2019 and the idea was to build a decentralized cloud storage platform uh for developers and uh, when you when i when i say decentralized cloud storage platform you could imagine something like uh an aws s3 or a google cloud storage uh where uh, but in our case we wouldn't own and operate any data centers the resources that is storage and bandwidth would actually come from independent third parties uh, who would do so for an incentive and in our case that would be a, a cryptocurrency and our motivation behind building this was to be able to uh, uh, be a platform that is faster uh, with greater emphasis on security and privacy and uh, of course cheaper by trying to leverage uh, at devices at the edge of the network like your smartphone uh, laptop uh, smart fridge etc etc so at at one point uh, after we launched uh, newfang and we took it to market uh, we realized that uh, you know the market that we were uh, catering to which happens to be the uh, web 3.0 uh, uh, set of developers basically people building decentralized apps uh they were uh, themselves in very early stage very very uh, novel stuff was happening and primarily they couldn't really afford to even pay us and that market was completely cornered by you know free credits from amazon and google and what have you and that's when we kind of decided that we uh, in order to uh, you know really survive we needed to have more stamina more runway and we wanted to figure out a way to get to uh, get to revenues faster so we did uh, but obviously we built all of this tech and the intellectual property which we really wanted to leverage so what we decided was uh, to build a product that basically we hoped other people would build on top of our platform and uh, which is how skizzle was born uh, we've been working on it since the beginning of this year and uh, we are now at the absolute cusp of you know uh, putting out a public beta very very shortly in the coming weeks and uh, uh, hopefully things will go well there so let me start talking to you about uh, skizzle right so let's set the context for what skizzle is uh, first um so we all share files every day whether it's for personal reasons or for work and some of these files just happen to be more important than others and when i say important they could be inherently valuable or contain sensitive information you know things like trade secrets intellectual property financial documents or even uh, just personal information right and uh, we usually share these files over email especially if it's 
trying to collaborate with uh, uh, people on the outside uh, uh, for internal uh, uh, for internal uh, sharing of files of course people use messengers and you know chat apps and things like that but more often than not we end up sharing these files over email uh, either as attachments or as links to file that actually sit on another service like say box dropbox or google drive the problem essentially is that attachments are unencrypted and even if there is encryption the encryption keys that are used to actually encrypt your file are owned and controlled by the service provider and uh, i mean you know uh, this basically means that they always have access to your files and in some cases with a few service providers that is by design because that is exactly the business model and if you were to try and go about encrypting and sharing an encrypted file with someone else you would have to jump some real user experience hoops you know where you would have to have you would you would have to generate your own uh, keys you would have to then uh, you know encrypt your files using software a upload it to software b and then finally go to your email and share a link and things like that so it's really not trivial for the average person so skizzle solves this and uh, skizzle in its current form is a browser extension that allows you to send and receive end to end encrypted files right in your email you never have to leave your inbox never have to use an, an additional tool to accomplish this and what is uh, uh, at least what we think is really great about uh, about about us is the fact that a lot of our back end is uh, on a blockchain and so basically what we do is every user action uh, is written to the blockchain so this brings about unprecedented amounts of uh, you know trust and transparency into how things work you'll see it in action very shortly once we do the demo and go through the talk so let's jump right into it so hopefully everything will go well so i'm in my inbox here and as you guys could perhaps see on the top right of my browser i already have the skizzle extension installed now if i want to send an encrypted file over to someone else i just have to do exactly the things that i'm used to doing right i hit compose you will see that skizzle introduces a little security bar here i turn skizzle security on which basically means that every attachment that i add to this email is now going to be a skizzle encrypted attachment i do what i normally would or intuitively do which is hit attach files then i go ahead and pick a file and now this file gets encrypted locally and gets uploaded to our servers and i simply have to say uh, who i want to send it to and i just hit send and that's it i don't have to do anything else on the receiver side uh, presuming that you know i have the extension already installed you just wait for a couple of seconds for the email to show up there you go uh i just need to click the email skizzle recognizes that there is an encrypted attachment and it goes ahead and fetches it and i just click it to start downloading that's literally it so from the sender sending the file to the receiver receiving it no one in between not even gmail not even the servers where we store the file the encrypted files and not even us none of us none of these people now no intermediaries ever have access to your file so uh, apart from this of course uh, the skizzle ui shows you you know files that you've sent and received you can in fact even just go ahead and you know see uh, get a few details of the file but more importantly see who who all have access to this file and like you see here i can go ahead and actually revoke access to anyone that i've shared with this is the i've just shared this email with i mean this file with uh, this particular address i go ahead and hit revoke and as soon as that is done and so you have complete control over who has access to your files and when 
obviously once a file has been downloaded you this there's literally nothing you can do but this starts to become very powerful when uh, you share a file with view only access and this is something that we are working on and we'll have released in our beta um so yeah i mean uh, where where this starts to get really interesting is you know we are saying all of these things about uh, you know these are the people who have access uh, you know everything is written to the blockchain but how do you kind of publicly verify all of this so we got that covered too uh, you simply have to say verify and this is an explorer that we built uh, which basically queries a public blockchain and kind of gets information of about you know all the files that have been uploaded if you if you jump in here so on the second while this loads up it kind of shows you all the activity on the network and you know uh, i can actually take a look at you know what all is happening i can even further go and verify this on the public blockchain that we are using you know just click on the uh, uh the transaction that occurred and i can go and you know look at all of the logs and kind of verify that you know whatever is being said is really is what is happening you can always take a look at you know uh what is the status with a particular file in this case this is a file that has just been uploaded it's not been shared with anyone not downloaded not revoked but all of this data is just pulled from the blockchain and so you can always verify but um the key thing here is if this is a public explorer uh it means that everyone anyone can basically access this so what we've done is we use only pseudonymous uh, identifiers as you can see here it says so and so user uploaded so and so file and so this way what we kind of ensure is that until and unless you know what you're looking for you really can't find it and if you are just kind of perusing through the explorer uh, you are none the wiser about who uh, the identity of people or what they are doing and what kind of files they are uploading right so uh, yeah so this is this is what skizzel does and this is uh, uh, in its in its current form like i said it's just a chrome extension we'll obviously expand it to other browsers we'd also love for it to play well with you know some of uh, the other uh, Uh, you know email clients out there we'll obviously look at outlook and of course you know all all of your mobile apps uh, for gmail or outlook or what have you all right so what is our motivation behind uh, building skizzle and in fact even with new fang and we always kind of seem to go back to uh, the seven principles of uh, uh, privacy by design and these are the seven principles listed here the pretty self explanatory but i'd i'd like to quickly gloss over them uh principle 1 says uh, proactive not reactive uh, preventative not remedial uh this basically means that you know if you are in the business of you know saying we look at privacy later and will then you are then you end up having a breach and then you are firefighting breaches and kind of trying to address things later uh then you are you know it's it's only going to get worse for you so you kind of need to be proactive when it comes to uh things like uh, privacy of data and especially users privacy uh principle 2 is privacy as the default so privacy is not a feature uh it's something that has to be part of uh, everything that you start doing uh which kind of takes us into uh, principle 3 which is saying privacy embedded into design uh so uh, your your entire system your architecture everything should be taking into account uh, privacy from the get go and it should also be positive sum not zero sum which basically means that if your attempts to to do good privacy and to to you know basically do do proper security for your system and for your users in the process if you are compromising on say user experience then uh then you are doing something wrong either you are not being creative enough or not not explored all of the options so at the end it really should not be this dichotomy of user experience versus say uh, system security or being uh, wholly private it has to be something that works together and positive sum uh 
uh, end to end security which basically talks about ensuring that you know the life cycle of the data right from the user uploading it or adding it uh, right up to the point where it can be fully deleted and removed from the system is completely taken care of you're not just sitting on idle data that is that really has no business being there and then visibility and transparency uh, talks about basically how uh, your entire system uh, needs to be uh, very accessible it should really play well with other open systems that are out there uh, we should i mean we can even talk about things like uh, you know all the critical pieces of your code being open source and also ways for your users and the public in general to be able to interact and also give feedback to whatever it is that you're doing uh, and finally just respect for user privacy uh, it 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 has to be with everything that you do every little tool that you use to improve your product or do anything else you have to take into account and ask the questions is this going to is this respectful of our users privacy and if the answer is no then it is something that you should uh, perhaps definitely look at avoiding so let's look at the broad architecture of uh, skizel there are five important parts to this one is obviously the extension and then you have we have our auth libraries we we use google uh, because right now we work with gmail so we use google auths to kind of verify users and we also use uh, 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 decentralized key uh, uh, key management system uh, from the guys at uh, torus we we'll go into some detail about that a little later so this is our these are the authentication libraries we use we have a we have an application server that kind of helps us with the overall ux obviously things like you know uploading files fetching data needs to be really fast and uh, you know uh, responsive and something that users are kind of used to and we then have our skizel storage network which is a basically a set of uh, storage nodes um, which kind of uh, act like a distributed file system and they basically handle storing of all the encrypted files and also handling any requests that are uh, coming their way and finally we have of course our smart contracts on a public blockchain and this is what kind of enables uh, the access management that we built into skizel uh, it's a decentralized access management system so it's not something which we run off a central server somewhere a, everything that you want to be able to do with re respect to providing access to your system is actually written in smart contracts which can be publicly audited and the code for this is also open source so let's kind of look at each of these uh, five pieces right and i'd like to look at them from the lens of you know what are we doing about the security and privacy aspects uh, that we uh, that we are so keen on ensuring in, within our system so the first piece is obviously uh, the extension uh, the extension is a, a vue js app and we if for those of you familiar with uh, chrome extensions uh, we use content scripts to actually talk to the email client so if you remember from the demo of uh, the piece about how the security bar is put into the compose window that happens through content scripts and we obviously leverage the browser's local storage to to store almost all of the data that is uh, kind of critical and we store it in encrypted form in local storage and we ensure that you know only stuff that really needs uh, to be on a server is on a server but otherwise everything else is uh, encrypted and stored in local storage so what are the security and uh, privacy implications uh, what are we doing to kind of ensure this so a user is uh, assigned crypto keys uh, and we'll see that in a minute and how that happens and we make sure that these keys are stored securely that is they are always encrypted uh, whenever not required uh, all the files are aes encrypted before they are uploaded and only publicly known information is stored unencrypted in your local storage in this case for what sorry about that 
And uh, what we also do is we make sure that the extension only works on the Gmail tab. Uh, this is with the express intent of um, making sure that, you know, a lot of extensions that you might have seen or used will say they require access to every site that you visit. For us, that is obviously not logically required. And also from a security perspective, we want to ensure that we're doing everything possible, which is why we make sure the extension only works on Gmail tab. <coughs> and the extension does not read emails. Uh, uh, the code for this will also be open source, so this can also be verified. Uh, the only thing that the extension does it, is, is it looks for a specific uh, HTML element in the email body just to be able to recognize if there is uh, a schizzle uh, encrypted attachment, uh, but otherwise it wholly ignores the rest of your content. Now the authentication libraries that I spoke of, uh, we use uh, Google Auth for sign up and we use uh, the Taurus Direct Auth. This is uh, the Taurus website. Sorry about that. Yeah, so this is uh, what Taurus does. And Taurus is essentially uh, a non custodial uh, key management system. So basically means that you, uh, although the kind of keys are generated by Taurus and they're a decentralized set of nodes, uh, the actual uh, uh, custodians are, are the users themselves. They can own and control the, the, their keys. So yeah, so in terms of security and privacy, we use Taurus and like I said, it's completely decentralized and it's non-custodial, which really works for us. Then of course we have the application server, which is kind of used to do a lot of, you know, quick work, uh, improve the UX. It stores some uh, file info of the users. And it's also what enables PGP. We'll, we'll kind of dive into this later on in the talk. And uh, it also, you know, kind of tracks uh, usage and billing handles, all payments uh, and uh, user billing and things like that. Uh, what we do is we basically don't store any data uh, that is non-essential on the servers. Like I said, everything is stored on the uh, extension itself in your browser. And we definitely don't store any sort of data that will help us uh, do you know, derive usage, usage graphs. So even if our servers are compromised, there is uh, really nothing that stands to be gained by the any attacker. Uh, we use standard JWT-based authentication for any API calls. And we always encrypt locally before storing any, any data that needs to be uh, you know, basically shared or retrieved at a later date. And also to allow for backups and for users to like move, move systems and things like that. Then we have our storage network, which like I said before is a is a set of nodes that basically runs a custom Tahoe LAFS app. So for those of you who don't know what Tahoe LAFS is, so Tahoe is a distributed file system. It was built by uh, uh, these two guys called Zuko Wilcox and Bram Cohen. Uh, Zuko is a very well-known cryptographer and Bram Cohen is the guy who created the BitTorrent protocol. And like I said, it's a you know, completely distributed file system and it does a lot of cool things, but you know, it was not enough. So we've basically gone ahead and uh, you know, made it our own. We forked their code and uh, brought it up to speed. It's, it's quite old, built in the mid 2000s. And what the network kind of also does is it performs something called erasure coding. Uh, erasure coding is basically uh, 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 basically a form of file encoding, which basically means that any encrypted file that is uploaded is broken up into a bunch of pieces and each piece sits on a unique storage node. And the breaking up of this file happens in such a way that you need only a subset of them to actually retrieve the entire file back. 
So it's more, you know, uh, elegant redundancy management when you compare it to a system like RAID. Um, just to give you an example, an encrypted file could be uploaded to our servers. It gets broken up into six pieces and you need only any four of those pieces to actually retrieve the file back. This means that if two nodes are down for any reason, your entire file can still be retrieved, no problem. And it obviously stores the encrypted files and affords for the downloads and deletions of these files. And it also does one important task of forwarding user, user signed transactions. And when I say this, it's basically uh, every, like I mentioned before, every user action is written to the blockchain. And what we do is we get the user to sign a transaction on the client with their cryptographic keys. And this signed transaction is then submitted by us uh, to the public blockchain. Um, and this is in a way to ensure that the users don't have to interact with the cryptocurrency or uh, you know, deal with anything that the blockchain has to, uh, the actions that the blockchain has to perform. And uh, we, we, we're doing this in the interest of uh, user experience and trying to ensure that you know, people don't have to uh, you know, uh, get themselves mangled with you know, handling keys and doing a lot of other things. And so a couple of the things that we kind of take care of uh, from a security standpoint is, of course, erasure coding is uh, to make it more fault tolerant, like I explained. It's a complete zero knowledge store. So none of the nodes know what they're storing. There is absolutely no way that, you know, any, any sort of data mining can be performed. And uh, they can't manipulate transactions. And uh, e even if they even if one of the nodes was compromised and any kind of uh, manipulated transaction were to be submitted to the blockchain, this would this transaction itself would fail and completely roll back if they're trying to spoof a user or to kind of change some of the uh, data that is being passed. And finally, we have the blockchain itself, uh, which is a set of smart contracts on uh, uh, on basically what is known uh, on a public blockchain called uh, Matic. Matic is uh, it's a company based out of Bangalore here in India. It's uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, and most used blockchains in the world. In fact, it is uh, uh, it's a layer two scaling solution on top of Ethereum. For those of you familiar with the blockchain space, will know that Ethereum can probably do about fourteen transactions per second, and Matic kind of enables. Uh, you know, doing thousands of transactions, if not more, per second. And uh, uh, this is the, the blockchain of our choice. It's completely public and decentralized. And uh, the blockchain, we also use it to store usage logs. And uh, the, we do this so that, you know, there is complete transparency even when it comes to your usage and consequently your billing and us uh, charging you. So, like I said, we use only public Ethereum identifiers. If you will remember from uh, the Explorer that I showed earlier, all of the identifiers are pseudonymous and they're, uh, even though public, you don't know who is the actual uh, owner of these uh, particular files, etc. And uh, the blockchain completely, uh, the blockchain bits kind of take care of the access control and we follow something, uh, basically what is known as the decentralized uh, ID spec. Uh, DIDs are something that are uh, coming into play. There is uh, a whole working group by the W3C uh, over here. So there's a lot of great work happening here and the idea behind decentralized identifiers, and I won't go into too much detail because this is a huge topic on its own. Um, is to basically give uh, uh, self-sovereign identity to people and even things. And so what we've done is we've taken the concepts and in fact, the entire specification behind uh, uh, DIDs and applied them to uh, files in our case. Uh, I'll go into more details on how, we, how this is actually implemented and how we actually perform access control based on DIDs. Um, 
And finally, we store only hashes of any personal data that are required, uh, like I mentioned earlier. So yeah, now, now let's get to the important bits, right? So uh, how do we actually perform this end-to-end -end encryption? Uh, we basically do a combination of symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So the symmetric part is, of course, we use AES-128 to encrypt the files using an encryption key that we generate on the fly on the client. And uh, we use standard PGP uh, to kind of uh, be able to encrypt the encryption key and share it with, uh, share it with someone else. So we'll go into more details about this uh, shortly. So to be able to kind of understand how we fully do E2E, there are, there are a couple of questions that we need to answer and, and we had to get right uh, in order to make this happen seamlessly. So the first one is how do we end up assigning keys, right? So I told you earlier that this process is not exactly straightforward. Um, how we assign keys is basically we have the extension here and uh, the extension, when the user performs a sign-up operation, uh, we get them verified uh, by Google Auth. And the Auth token is then forwarded to the Taurus network, which is basically a set of nodes that are doing, uh, what they're doing is they're constantly generating public-private key pairs. There is a buffer of public-private key pairs that are constantly uh, generated. And when this user is authenticated, and let's say this is the first time user, uh, uh, basically uh, the Taurus network spits out you know, some cryptographic material. Uh, each of the nodes kind of generates a piece of what will be the key pair. And these pieces are then sent over to the client. And then it is all pieced together and then decrypted to actually give us the actual public-private key pair, which we store locally within the extension itself. So in one seamless Google sign-up operation, uh, a user is actually assigned public, a public-private key pair that they actually own and control. So then, now that we've done that, once we've assigned keys to people, the next process is obviously how do we handle uploads, right? So we have the client here, which is basically a combination of the browser and the Skizel extension. And from my Gmail UI, I obviously pick a file from my hard disk. This file gets encrypted on the client itself, like I mentioned, and the encryption key that is generated is then pushed to the local storage over here. And then the encrypted file itself is then uploaded to the uh, storage uh, node network. And the encrypted file is then, like I mentioned earlier, is erasure coded, broken up into multiple pieces with each piece sitting on a separate node. And once this operation is performed, we submit a signed transaction, basically logging that user operation, uh, which is the upload operation uh, onto the blockchain. And once the upload succeeds, uh, the client is then informed and uh, we managed to kind of fully upload a completely encrypted file. So this, we've done one part of uh, the E2E process. Then how do we handle file sharing, right? So this is the critical element uh, of uh, the whole process. Now, it, this is akin to me hitting the send button on Gmail. And when, when you actually hit the send button uh, in your Gmail client, when you're using Skizzle, this kind of, basically invokes our Skizzle server to talk to the smart contract and create uh, what is uh, a basically a decentralized ID, a DID for the file that was uploaded and then shared. This uh, document that is generated, let, let us take a quick look at it and how that looks. And this follows the W3C DID spec. And if you were to kind of piece together all of the piece, uh, individual elements of uh, all that we do on the, on, on the blockchain and in our smart contracts is you'd arrive with, you know, like a JSON that looks like this. Um, there's a bunch of material here. Uh, there, like I mentioned, there will, uh, every file is assigned a DID. Uh, apart from the DID, of course, you know, there's some information about when it was created and when it was updated. 
And then there is some information about the public key, which basically talks about who is the owner. So there's some information about that, who is the owner of the file. And then there is uh, mechanisms for how you can authenticate uh, the ownership of this particular file. And the, the key pieces, key piece here is about the services that are exposed. And these are completely open. Uh, the, we're talking about services like, for example, checking if a particular user has access. And there'll be a particular service endpoint for it. And similarly, uh, there, there are other services like get all users, which is to basically say who, who are the different users who have access to this particular file. And there are so many other such you know, services that we've incorporated. And this can be obviously extended uh, hugely. And uh, then we go into a few more details about you know, what is the file size, uh, something called the UEB hash, which is basically the Merkle tree of, uh, of, of the file that was encrypted. Uh, what the UEB hash serves as is the way to check the file integrity when it is downloaded. So if you're able to kind of build the entire Merkle tree back and arrive at this UEB hash, that means you've gotten the, the file that you actually uploaded and it is correct. And this is what uh, the DID document for a particular file that was uploaded uh, actually looks like. And this is what we kind of use uh, within our smart contracts to figure out if some user has access to a particular file or not. And then the last bit is, of course, how do we manage downloads? So the recipient uses uh, the extension again. And what they do is they basically make a request to the storage network, uh, the storage node network, to uh, fetch the file. And uh, based on the DID of the file, uh, the storage node network checks if the smart contract uh, uh, on the smart contract if that this particular recipient has access. And if this user indeed has access, then the file is decoded back and the encrypted file is then transferred over to the client. Now, asynchronously, there is also a call that goes out to our application server, which fetches the encrypted encryption key. So when a file is uploaded and shared with someone, the, the the encryption key that was used is then uh, further encrypted with the with the recipient's public key, and oh, that means that only this particular recipient with uh, can can basically decrypt this encrypted encryption key with their own private key. So if anyone else kind of managed to get hold of the encrypted file, they would still not have access to the uh, encryption key in order to decrypt the file. So it's almost like double layer protection. So this is essentially how we, we, we've kind of enabled end-to-end -end encryption on our system. Uh, what's next for us is a bunch of things. Uh, like for example, uh, we need to be able to handle forward and backward secrecy. Uh, uh, just to quickly kind of let you guys in on what that means. So uh, backward secrecy is basically saying that if, a, if, if basically a set of keys or a secret is, is exposed uh, at any given point in time, uh, that means that you know, the, the, the system or, or the files that are actually uploaded should not be then uh, uh, still available to this uh, attacker who's managed to get hold of these keys at a later date. Uh, forward secrecy is, you know, if there is basically like a passive attacker who's kind of uh, putting together all the encrypted files, somehow he gets hold of them, and then later on in, in the future gets hold of a set of keys uh, or some secrets that will de decrypt these files, he should not be able to do so. So this is something that we want to be able to implement. There are great resources on how uh, some people do it, I would definitely urge you guys to look at uh, uh, Signal, uh, the messaging app, and they have done some fantastic work in this space. Uh, next is to obviously be able to deal with malicious users and malware. Right? So one of uh, this in fact came up very recently and uh, the question was, how do you deal with 
you know malware being sent using skizzle and this is uh, this is an issue for any system that is end to end encrypted because you cannot uh, uh, basically you know process files that are already encrypted and there is no real great way to actually do this uh there are workarounds that we are at the moment considering and I'd, i'd love to go into details of that uh, perhaps if anyone has any questions and uh, which kind of brings us to one of the ways we can actually uh, deal with malware is and but more importantly do a whole bunch of other things is uh, being able to process uh, uh, process over encrypted data so this is possible with uh, homomorphic encryption uh, which basically means that you can uh, let data remain uh, fully uh, encrypted and without decrypting actually process that particular data uh, one of the things that you could do in your processing is actually detect for malware and without ever needing access to keys or the actual data itself there's some great work going on in this space and there are a lot of pocs that are getting built uh uh this is a very old concept from the 1980s if i'm not wrong um but you know uh, hardware or need to catch up and then software need to catch up and now we're getting really close uh, there's some good pocs uh, the only problem is it's really slow to do homomorphic encryption uh, and process data over it at the moment but i think it's just a matter of time where this will be possible and lastly from a tech standpoint or what we are definitely looking at doing next is extending skizzel beyond being like uh, an extension or a or an add on for different services uh, and start giving developers access to apis and sdks so they can actually use whatever we built in in their in their apps and in their products especially if uh, their apps and products are, are privacy and security centric so this is something that we want to be able to do next so yeah i mean thank you uh i would love for you guys to kind of uh, follow us on twitter we are at skizzle.email you can uh, basically check out our website at which is skizzle.email or write into us at hello@skizzle.email we are definitely looking for people to share some some feedback and uh, let us know more um uh yeah i mean you know if if you guys have any questions i'm more than happy to take them at this point okay some interesting questions kind of emerged um, before i go into the technical questions some of the people want to know more about your product itself uh -huh. are you open uh, can people uh, sign up it's skizzle uh, is it free are yeah. you charging uh, yeah. and is when you say the code will be open source people are asking where it is yeah yeah so yeah i mean you know we're just getting to the point where uh, we are going to release the product uh, uh, we are going to be releasing our our free plan of our free forever plan in a couple of weeks and uh, following that we'll have a bunch of uh, Uh, paid plans as well uh, which will basically uh, give you guys more storage and the ability to perform more actions on the files and uh, so yeah the free plan will be out in a in a few weeks from now uh, you can sign up on our website to kind of get notified as soon as we launch uh, apart from that uh, yeah uh, yeah our, our code will all be uh, like all the important bits at least will be open source very shortly you can keep checking our website we'll we'll, op we'll open source it all we'll have links to our github over there uh, very very soon and you know ev everyone can participate go ahead and fork bits that make sense some raise issues uh, etc okay so you you explained the issue with malware in an end to end encrypted system yeah. uh, but there are issues that block blockchain also brings in right like you are essentially putting i mean you are anonymizing stuff uh, you are pseudonymizing the content but you are essentially putting for a fact that you and i have potentially communicated yeah okay. but it's 
probably not known through the public blockchain that it is you, you and me. Yeah. Uh, but the fact remains that I and you are signed up on Skizzle's network. Yeah. The email ID are part of your network. Now, yeah. when you're talking about malware actors, uh, the kind of actors which are involved in those hacker groups, but also at the same time, you have nation state actors, right? right. Like when you're looking at nation state actors, especially the kind of people uh, who don't want government to know what they're sending or whom they're even talking to. Mm. Uh, blockchain kind of removes that whole deniability factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So where do you see the issue lies with that? I mean, I know you're trying to anonymize and pseudonymize things, but say tomorrow you do get a request asking you to give the list of all of the users on your platform. Nothing more. Yeah. Uh, what sort of threat vector and the, um, how can one evade that? Are you saying that you have systems in place that this stops it? Or are you saying this is a trade-off that we can't take it away? Uh, to be honest, it'll be a bit of both. But uh, let me tell you what what is currently not possible. If we need to kind of, if our hand is forced and we kind of need to give up uh, user details, uh, that is something that... Uh, I mean, we, if we have to give up, you know, a list of user emails, then that's absolutely possible that we'd be forced into doing that. But we don't maintain a mapping of uh, user emails to uh, public addresses. So that is, in fact, is something where uh, Taurus comes in. And because it is uh, uh, zero knowledge itself, in a sense, like there is, they, they maintain that mapping. Uh, we don't actually have that mapping of users to emails. So this is something that uh, at least, you know, it's it skirts the issue. I completely get that. It's uh, something that we'd have to kind of deeply look at uh, and kind of figure out, you know, going forward, how do we, how do we deal with this? Uh, uh, although, so, so uh, we are dealing with like really uh, potentially very sensitive information that and we might attract all the bad actors that you can uh, imagine, including state actors. Um, so uh, it's it's honestly something that we'll have to figure out a way to deal with. Uh, we'll have to, uh, you know, probably we'll have to take a call at some later date to kind of deal with only, you know, a certain sort of organizations or enterprises and not make it available to the general public at all. Yeah, so the trade-offs do exist. Like yeah. no system can be that perfect. Unless no, absolutely. You, you're controlling it on your own. So the kind of trade-offs that say Signal is providing, uh, yeah. one can't really get them without owning infrastructure or mitigating it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, like you rightly said, if you don't own the infrastructure and things like that, then you kind of, uh, you know, you, you're, you, you're not in full control. This is something we do want to mitigate. Uh, we have some plans, including probably, you know, doing uh, uh, things where we, we completely own almost all of the infrastructure, but then we'd have to kind of worry about uh, business trade-offs. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, this is uh, uh, something that we'd have to uh, deal with. Okay, so the only question I have was on homomorphic encryption. That's a really interesting thing that's like upcoming, yet upcoming. I mean, think yes. there have been various good developments, but still not there yeah. for people to use it at a commercial scale. I mean, yeah. I know there is uh, Microsoft uh, has a product on it. I forgot what it's called. Uh, yeah, Microsoft, uh, IBM also Seal. has. No, Microsoft Seal. Uh, they have an open source yeah. uh, system which, where, uh, where people can use it for homomorphic encryption. Yeah. Uh, but I guess it would require some, maybe another five years is what I think. What do you think? What would be the time for this to emerge? I mean, it depends on who you talk to, honestly. 
there are people in this space who are extremely optimistic and are saying things as early as next year. Uh, if I forget the website, uh, uh, which actually kind of is like a like a like trying to be like a central body for for stuff that's going on here. It's like an index for all all the cool stuff in the HME space. Uh, but yeah, I mean you know uh, it's been a while coming. Uh, we obviously need systems and software to kind of uh, rise up to that level. But I, I don't. I, I think the timeline is is that I think it's one to five years. Is probably when we'll really see some very very cool stuff in this space, and it's and it's honestly hotting up. I mean, you know, I uh, I've I've uh, I've seen a few startups uh, that are aiming to do exactly this. You know, they're now coming out of like stealth mode. Uh, still no details on how they're exactly going about doing this, but I I, I guess with the just looking at the activity, I think we're we should be fairly close. Okay, I don't think we have more questions on that, but if there is anything that you want to show, I think we have some time. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, what was the site, if I can just kind of bring that up. Uh, I'll probably put it into my slides uh, uh, in in my index uh, later on, uh, if that's okay. Yes, sure. Uh, I think this has been really helpful. Uh, uh, if more people want to ask Mayur a question, Mayur kind of hangs out of this Telegram group where all of us are talking about cryptography. Uh, if you're here listening to the conversation, you can just join us there. Uh, it's uh, t.me slash crypto chat uh, And you can just search for it at crypto chat. And if you're working on some of these uh, uh, issues and if you have that problems, you probably already solved, like some of the problems that Mayur mentioned, right? Like, how would you start recognizing malware with the need to systems? Or if you have questions, you could just reach out to Mayur. And uh, uh, we're trying to see, I mean, even in homomorphic encryption, right? Like we're trying to understand what's happening in the space and if people have new techniques that they are trying to adopt or evolve, I would be happy to listen. Anything else that you want to say, Mayur? Uh, then we can end the conversation. No, oh, I mean, uh, that's about it. Really glad to have this opportunity. And, you know, like I said, if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to us on any of these channels that I mentioned. And, you know, we'll be more than happy to engage with anybody with any interesting questions or you know, feedback for us. Uh, or, you know, if you simply want to be able to try out Skizzle uh, very soon. Thanks.